Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, and I'm the Barbara Rabin Chief Education Officer at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I would like to thank you very much for joining us for tonight's History Highlights Program, Remembering Kristallnacht. I'd like to start tonight by thanking our community partners for this program, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Lone Star, Congregation Anshay Torah, Mental Health America of Dallas, Mosaic Family Services, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, Texas Holocaust, Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. Thank you all so very much for your support. I would also like to welcome our museum members and our board members joining us this evening. Thank you for your continued support of the museum and our programs. We will leave time for questions and answers at the end of tonight's program. Please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions, and we will get to as many of them as we can. I will be presenting tonight's program alongside Felicia Williamson, who is our amazing director of library and archives, and will be sharing with you this evening a considerable uh, selection of things from our archives that help to illustrate Kristallnacht and experiences of local Dallas area survivors at this time. So let's get started. Uh, Felicia, are you ready to join us? Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm going to share a PowerPoint and then We'll get started. Just one second. Okay, does that look okay? Uh, that sure does. Okay. Well, Sarah, uh, Dr. Abosh, why don't you get started and introduce our topic? I think for a lot of us, Crystal Noct is a word we've heard and maybe we know a little bit about it but it's certainly something that in my study of the holocaust when i began to learn more and more about it it really changed my understanding of how this one night um, evolved and it and it was experienced by many families across germany and really across the what was then at that time the reich um, as it expanded Okay, happy to do so. So um, before we get to Kristallnacht, we need to do, you know, five minutes worth of um, historical background. So we'll start with the rise of the Nazis to power in 1933. And when the Nazis come to power, they almost immediately begin to put pressure on Germany's Jews. Um, early pressure uh, comes in the form of a whole series of pieces of legislation that beginning to, to, to kind of carve Jews as citizens out of the general German population. So, um, and, and then actions as well. So we, kn we know that uh, by March of 33, uh, there have been three or four Jews already sent to Dachau, which is one of the earliest concentration camps that, that get, gets opened. Um, but the focus uh, at this point is not on uh, mass incarceration of Jews. We know that in April, of uh, that um, uh, year, so April of 33, April 1 of 33, there is a nationwide boycott against Jewish businesses that is imposed. Uh, flat, fast forward to uh, 1935, um, September through November, there's a series of laws that are passed. Uh, they're called the Nuremberg Laws. And what they essentially do is define what is a Jew and they define what is a Jew for purposes of then mistreating um, and applying all sorts of legislation uh, to people of uh, Jewish, Jewish heritage or as the Nazis call it, Jewish blood. Um, part of that also uh, of the Nuremberg laws is that these laws deprive Jews of citizenship. So they really become subjects of the German uh, state of the Nazi uh, Third Reich, but they don't have the rights of citizenship. So these are some of the kinds of laws uh, that are passed. 
Um, as uncomfortable as this is, and as onerous as this is for Jewish uh, citizens uh, and then subjects of the Reich, it's not enough to make all Jews think that there is no future for them in Germany. We do know that beginning in 33, many German Jews leave the country. Uh, and we can talk about this a little bit later on when we talk about um, immigration uh, through some of the material that uh, Felicia will be sharing with you, or excuse me, not immigration, emigration with an E. Um, but uh, what we need to talk about now is Kristallnacht and what, what was the immediate cause of Kristallnacht uh, and then what Kristallnacht itself was and then what were the results of Kristallnacht. And Felicia will be illustrating this throughout the evening uh, with uh, ma materials that we, we have in our collections. So Kristallnacht represents the first mass outbreak of anti-Jewish violence in areas controlled by the Third Reich. Kristallnacht happens November 9th, the evening of November 9th, into the day of November 10th. Um, and uh, it is uh, pretty brutal. And, and, and I'll come to that in just a moment. But what precipitates it? Well, we know for a fact that the Nazi hierarchy by 38 uh, is feeling more and more and more uh, comfortable and entrenched in Germany. It's feeling increasingly hostile toward the Jewish population. It's seeking to destroy economically the Jewish population because it doesn't, it doesn't see that there's any benefits to uh, the economic positions that the Jews hold uh, within Germany. And they're looking for some sort of an excuse to move against the Jews. That excuse is provided uh, beginning in late October of 1938. So in late October of 1938, the Germans round up 17,000 Jews resident in Germany who are of Polish heritage. And they pull them out of their homes and they shuttle them to the Polish German border and they literally toss them over the border and they say, you're Poles, <laughs> you're Poland's problem now, go. Poland in March of that same year, so March of 38, had passed a law of citizenship that was not in the language of the law directed at Jews, but was very much directed at Jews and particularly Jews who had left Poland for Germany and for Austria seeking a better life. And what this law of citizenship did is it said, if you had not been in Poland for the past five years, your citizenship was essentially revoked. And so in rounding up these Poles who were resident in Germany, many had been there for decades. These were not people who had just arrived in Germany and forcing them into Poland. What happened was you created a whole series now, 17,000 stateless Jews. They're no longer allowed in Germany and the Poles won't let them in. The border area between Germany and Poland uh, in uh, late October, early November of any fall, uh, makes the weather we've been having here in the evening seem positively balmy. I mean, this is this is cold weather. This is miserable weather. One of the families that was shoved over the border was the family Greenspan, and the family Greenspan had a son who was 17 years old, a, a young man, five feet tall, a little little bitty guy, um, named. Herschel and Herschel Greenspan was in Paris studying and he receives a postcard from his sister talking about how miserable the conditions are and how terribly Herschel and her parents are doing stuck in this no man's land between Poland and Germany. The result of this is that Herschel decides to do something, to strike a blow for, for his parents and for German Jews suffering. And he goes out and he buys a gun and he goes to the German embassy in uh, Paris and he walks into the German embassy. He is asked to see the ambassador out on the street and he's directed into the embassy. And the first person that he sees, whom he apparently assumes is the ambassador, it's actually the third secretary, is a, is a guy in his late 20s named 
Ernst von Raff and he shoots Ernst von Raff. He makes no effort to run. He says, I did it. He's arrested uh, on the spot. Ernst, Ernst von Raff um, is mortally wounded. Um, that happens November 7th. Von Raff hangs on until November 9th. And on November 9th, he dies. Well, November 9th happens to also be the anniversary of the famous or infamous, depending on your view, Beer Hall Putsch of 1923, during which Hitler attempted to throw overthrow the government of Munich, Germany in an effort to start a a Nazi revolution in Bavaria and take over the country. And as if you remember your history, it's a failure. A number of his operatives are killed. He's jailed for a year and a half. He writes Mein Kampf, my, my struggle, and you know, and and we're off to the races. So they're in Munich. Hitler, um, uh, Goebbels, um, uh, Heydrich in the beer hall, uh, talking over old times, plotting strategy, which they do every year on the anniversary of this on the 9th. And word comes in late that night or early the next morning that Von Raff has died from his wounds. And Hitler turns to Goebbels, his propaganda minister, and they whisper to each other pretty quickly. And he basically says to Goebbels, this was what we were waiting for. This was the um, event that we can use to spark our, our physical move against the Jews of Germany. And he says to Goebbels that this should, these should be spontaneous outbreaks of German rage against what happened to a good German at the hands of a Jew uh, in Paris. And an order actually goes out from Goebbels, uh, I, found a copy of it at Yad Vashem, but the order goes out around the country at 1.20 a.m. Uh, on uh, the night of the 9th into the, into the morning of the 10th. And it sparks, you'll pardon the expression, spontaneous uprisings all over Germany, Austria, which is now German territory because it has been um, taken over through Anschluss, and the Sudetenland, uh, which, as you'll remember, was taken in September, or it wasn't taken, it was handed over to the Germans. So the section of Czechoslovakia that is now owned by the Germans, it sparks uprisings. These uprisings aren't really uprising. What, what these really are is mass anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish uh, riots. And the riots are led by the Sturmabteilung, so the, the SA, uh, the Stuttstaffel, so the SS, the local party Gauleiters get involved, so Nazi party officials, uh, Hitler youth, and some civilians. And you have outbreaks across this area. Um, and what this map shows that, um, that, that Felicia has up right here is a sprinkling of some of the areas where violence occurred. Uh, you'll notice they call it a nationwide pogrom. I don't use the term pogrom because pogrom is an older term that refers to a pattern of anti-Jewish violence that existed in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Um, this German violence is overtly state-sponsored violence, and it's part of a German pattern. It's not part of this older pogrom pattern, which was frequently um, uh, rising up by local peasantry or local townsfolk, and the government would stand back in the East, but they didn't spark these things. And this was deliberately sparked and then continued by German officials. Um, Felicia, uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so I have a series of slides and I just wanna show you what some of the violence looks like. And the reason I did this is because we think of Kristallnacht as a series of destruction uh, focused on, uh, destructive acts focused on synagogues and places of, of business. And in fact, Jewish homes are destroyed across the Reich. Uh, and this photo, um, I think, is, is a perfectly illustrative photo. This is from a home in Vienna. Vienna is one of the most cultured cities in Europe, which is the most cultured city, or excuse me, the most cultured continent uh, uh, in, in the world at this time. Uh, 
you know, I don't believe that, but that is the popular belief at the time. And what you'll notice here is that the Nazi uh, officials and the Nazi troops have come in and they take knives, they take crowbars, and they utterly destroy whoever's house this is. They take uh, feather beds and they slice through them. They throw things out windows. I'm actually amazed that that chandelier is still standing because we have other reports of them ripping out electrical appliances, throwing stuff in the, in the streets. The reason I show this to you is because they attack people where they live. Uh, next slide, Felicia, please. The second thing that they do, and I'm not giving this to you in the order that it was done because, because all of these happened at the same time, is that they attacked synagogues all over um, uh, the Reich. This synagogue in Eschwege um, was set on fire. Ultimately, the roof collapses. You can see that the damage that has been done here is not fire-based damage. This was a deliberate kicking, snapping, and hatcheting, that isn't a word, but you know what I mean, of um, the, the wooden um, pews and other materials. Um, there's, there's Torah sections in there. Uh, we know that uh, Sidurs, Sidurim, um, the uh, prayer books have been thrown out on the street. And there's two reasons I use this photo. The first reason is because Eshvega is where two of our uh, survivor members uh, are from, uh, Bert Romberg and his uh, older sister by, by one whole year, uh, Maggie First, were kinder transportees. And what drove them to the kinder transport was the violence that they and their mother experienced in Eschwege, which was their town, during Kristallnacht. They left shortly thereafter. The other reason I, I did this is because the, the wording over the top of the Aron or, or Ark, uh, it says, Dalifne mi uh, ata omed. And it's a classic phrase that you'll see in a lot of synagogues. And it's a beautiful one. Um, and it's not something that the Nazis paid any attention to, but it, what it means is know before whom you stand. In other words, that God is here. This is God's house. Um, and and it's, it's just terribly ironic, I think. Uh, Felicia, next slide, please. This slide uh, is something that I'm assuming most of you who, who have any knowledge of uh, World War II or the Holocaust have seen. It's extremely famous. It's in our museum as well. And it is the um, Ober Ramstadt uh, synagogue, which I think is um, uh, near Darmstadt. So it's a, it's a working class area, um, which is neither here nor there. And what you're seeing is the, the building in flames, but what you're also seeing is onlookers who are looking at the camera because, you know, a camera is always exciting. Um, it's not just children, there's an adult there. And what you see are fire hoses and you can see a fireman in front of the, the uh, fence there in the background heading in the center of the picture and background heading toward the synagogue. But what you'll notice is that neither one of these fire hoses, there's two um, uh, jets of water that are being shot out. They're not being directed at the synagogue. They're being directed at the German owned building next door to the synagogue. And this happens, we have reports of this happening over and over and over again. And it turns out that Goebbels in the order that he sent out at 1.20 in the morning said to fire and policemen, and, and he wasn't talking directly to them, he was talking to, to German party operatives, SASS and actually um, via, via, via Himmler, we know that, that the Gestapo were, were activated for this. And what they were told is to not stop firemen and, or policemen from protecting German property. But there was no nothing about destruction of Jewish property. In other words, that was perfectly acceptable. And so this is a this is just a a, a thing of beauty when you see it. I mean, these are policemen and firemen who are and your neighbors, all of whom are meant to 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 protect, console, and help you. And they're they're letting this synagogue burn, and they're doing it deliberately. So, Felicia, next next photo please. This is the ceremonial hall from the so-called New Jewish Cemetery. This is also Vienna. Um, and I just wanted to show you um, that the destruction hits homes, 
It hits places of worship. It hits places of burial. So from birth to death, to worship, to everything in between, all those things that make us feel home and place and belonging are what the Nazis hit out on over Kristallnacht. Uh, Felicia, next slide, please. This is a department store. Uh, uh, this was in, uh, I believe it's in Berlin, but I could be wrong. Uh, it's been destroyed. It was gutted. It was burned. It's the Bamberger Hertz department store. Um, and again, just to show you that there was tremendous property destruction involved as well. Uh, Felicia, next slide, please. Okay. And, and before we get to this, let me just give a couple of numbers and then, and then take it away. Um, to let you know what else happened, Jews are publicly mocked, they're threatened, they're harassed, they're beaten in the streets, and they're, and they're killed. Um, we know that between 91 and 96 Jews are beaten to death over Kristallnacht in the streets of the Reich. We know that the police and firefighters, for the most part, stand by and do nothing. We know that two to 300 Jews committed suicide over the course of Kristallnacht. We know that more than 1,700 synagogues, some of which went back hundreds of years, are destroyed over those two, uh, two, two days and one night uh, in Germany, Austria, and uh, the Sudetenland. We know that more than 7,500 businesses were looted. We know that 30,000 Jewish men during Kristallnacht were rounded up and were shipped off to concentration camps. And there's more, but we'll come back to that. Felicia. Thank you. Um, what you said really struck me about birth and home and death because that made me think of this artifact. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this is, I, I mean, we have many artifacts that have special meaning to us. And I know for Sarah and for me, this artifact is one of those. Um, Fred Strauss um, has passed away, but he was a really special survivor in our community for several years. And, and he donated this artifact to us. His grandfather went into the synagogue and pulled this out after it was partially destroyed during Kristallnacht. And they managed to get it all the way here to the United States after they immigrated. And it shows how important it was. And I frankly didn't know what a wimple was. It's a unique kind of artifact. It's only produced in a small area in Germany by certain um, German Jews. And it's decorated cloth that's wrapped around the Torah during spe special times in a um, young boy's life. So at the very beginning, it's a swaddling cloth, and then it's um, torn into strips and then decorated. And then it has specific sayings um, that are inscribed or embroidered or decorated. And Sarah, do you want to mention what they are? Yeah, sure. Um, so the uh, the upper section of the wimple, uh, uh, wimple or vimple um, that we're looking at uh, says Meir Bar Binyamin uh, Strauss. <laughs> I can't, I can't, sorry, can't do the German. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. it's Mayor, uh, uh, son of Benjamin Strauss. So that's, that was, that was Fred Strauss's birth name. Then it says, um, Nolad uh, uh, Kachet, um, Adar Sheni Tirzav Lifek. So it tells you that he was born in the in in the in second Adar. So he was born uh, in a um, a leap year. Um, so there's an extra month added because the Jewish calendar isn't based on 365. It's a it's a lunar solar uh, mix. Um, anyway, that's for another discussion. Um, and then the second uh, uh, section of it, because this is really long, as Felicia said, uh, says. Hashem yidgalehu letora v'lechupa v'lemaasim tovim amen sela. May God um, help him to grow to the study of Torah, to the wedding canopy, 
uh, and to uh, the, the doing of good de deeds, uh, uh, amen, um, uh, God, God, your rock. Um, it, and those are, it's a standard phrase. It's not, they weren't being clever. <laughs> I mean, it was just what was done back then, so. Well, and so this one artifact, you know, when we're talking about artifacts in the museum and this artifact is on display in the museum, um, it's always what does the artifact tell us and what can we learn about in one kind of fell swoop and this artifact tells us so much first of all it tells us um a little bit about fred's story and about his grandfather's story but it also tells us a lot about kristallnacht because this artifact was almost destroyed this um synagogue and pult was um partially destroyed the fire was put out so it wasn't completely destroyed um and so his grandfather was able to go in the next day and retrieve this um, very personal and meaningful artifact. And then it was so important to the family that they managed to bring it all the way to the United States. If you think about the things that you, you would choose to take on that journey, I think that says a lot. Um, it also says to me, if you imagine what was under attack when the Nazis were out there destroying these synagogues, this is an example of what was under attack in a very personal way. This family put effort and care into this item that would have been something that would follow this child's life from birth all the way to, to as Sarah was saying, death. And it was, you know, a, a piece of cloth, but a meaningful item both religiously and for that family. So that was under attack. It survived, but if you imagine how many didn't, I think that's impactful. Um, I think for me, one thing that is clear when you look at the artifacts, that Kristallnacht escalated for many families, plans that were often already underway to leave Germany. For many Jewish families, the increasing pressures from the, from the Nazis on German life um, for Jewish families was making people pursue immigration. It wasn't easy, um, but many people had plans underway. And if they didn't, they were watchful. And that's very clear in the document collections we have. They were watching what the, the Nazis were doing and they were obviously very concerned. I mean, they had experienced anti-Semitism. They had experienced increasing anti-Semitism. They had experienced obviously the Nuremberg laws that Sarah mentioned. And so there was a great deal of concern. But when Kristallnacht happens, that concern escalates to serious panic, especially for the families for whom a, a parent or grandparent is arrested. And the only way, if you're arrested, you could get out of the camp as if you could prove that you had immediate plans to immigrate. And so that becomes a next level of pressure. Um, Sarah, do you wanna take a minute to talk about that? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to show what, uh, Another aspect of Kristallnacht looked like this is this is Baden Baden. This is November tenth, thirty eight. So it's it's still Kristallnacht because Kristallnacht goes well into the next day. These are old Jews. Um, they have uh, they're Jewish men. Um, they have been pulled from their homes by local Nazis. Um, you'll see uh, down the center of this the 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 men in the black are all are all Nazi troops. Um, and they are in the process of being deported. They are going to be marched through uh, Baden-Baden um, as a public spectacle. And you'll see people standing on the other side of the street, on the far side of the street, and watching this. Uh, we know that very few Germans lifted a finger to help their neighbors, um, which gave Hitler the sign that he had been looking for. Um, he was always cautious in these pre-war days to see if there was going to be any kind of resistance to what he was doing. There, there was barely any. And these folks are, are sent to uh, Sachsenhausen. Next slide, Felicia. 
Then this is Buchenwald, 1938, after Kristallnacht. Um, you'll notice that they, they're, nobody's even wearing a uniform. Um, this is so early uh, in, in this period, um, A and B, these are, these are Jews who have been taken in after Kristallnacht. Remember, there's, there's 30,000 who are rounded up um, and they're wearing their own clothing. Um, the third place that uh, Jewish men were sent to uh, was, uh, so Buchenwald, Dachau, Sachsenhausen. Those were the three uh, in the fallout from, from Kristallnacht. What we know is that the vast majority of these 30,000 were held there November, December, and released. Um, before they were released, they were required to send to sign certificates certifying that they had been well treated. Uh, we also know that there were a number of Jews who were not released because they died. They were beaten to death or, or, or tortured while they were in here. Um, and we also have uh, a survivor uh, within our community who is now, I believe, 102 years young, uh, Heinz Wallach who in 38 was rounded up and shipped, I believe, to Dachau with his father. His father was released within a few weeks. He wasn't released until January. Um, and obviously he, he, he survived, which is a whole other story. Felicia? Yeah. I have to remember to unmute myself. Well, I'm going to take a few moments to talk about some of the ways Kristallnacht played out for families that ended up in the North Texas area. One of the families that we know a lot about because of the archival collection they donated is the Kahn collection. Uh, the Kahn family um, is, a, for one thing, they're amazing because, you know, archivists love families like this because they keep everything. Uh, we have almost a thousand items in their collection. Actually, I think by the time we're completely done, it'll be well more than a thousand. Um, but one of the results of that is we really have a ton of different ways of understanding how Kristallnacht impacted this one family because they kept so much documentation. And just to get started, here's some members of this really large complex family. Um, Dr. Paul Kahn, Carl Kahn, who's a little boy here in 1926, ends up being picked up, and then Adolf Kahn in Baden-Baden, which Sarah just showed you what was happening in Baden-Baden during Kristallnacht, so you can get a little preview of where these fellas are going to end up during Kristallnacht. So um, here's a few excerpts from letters from the Kahn collection talking about Kristallnacht. So Dr. Paul Kahn was retained and sent to Dachau and he sends his wife a letter with instructions on how to address correspondence um, with very strict instructions on how to reach him that he's in barrack room three and he had been detained in November of 1938. And here we can see this is now Two weeks later. So he's been in a couple of weeks. He ended up being in for um, six weeks, I think, by the end of it. Then here, just one second, let me get my little window down. Um, this is a letter. The Khan family ended up losing, like uh, Jewish families across the Reich, all um, access to their um, business and um, homes and any form of um, ability to earn money. And so part of that process included this uh, correspondence where they're trying to get help from extended family members to expedite getting their um, finances in order. And so during after Kristallnacht, during the process of Aryanization, where basically the Nazis are forcing them to sell out their business um, holdings, they're asking for help from, from people across Europe that they know to, to get rid of their company. <clears throat> There's an, finally a really interesting document um, 
And this is where Dr. Khan is trying to get restitution for, and he and he lists this in, in, in fairly great detail for Judaica, prayer books, and other materials, including jewelry, and even the taxes that he had to pay to exit Germany um, as he was forced out of Baden-Baden during Kristallnacht. And further, he his entire law, law practice was dissolved and he had to sell it under duress due to his arrest during Kristallnacht. And so this document is listing out this um, aggression, basically, in legal form and and he was a lawyer and he kept good track of all of this and there's another document which i didn't include that actually shows this is the 1938 crystal knock version but in 1933 dr khan was forced to show the nazis his ability to practice law based on when he was born, which was one of the first ways of proving whether you're Aryan or not. And if you're born before 1914, you had a certain level of proof you had to prove. And if you fought in the war, there's a second level of proof. There was a way of, for a while, navigating the Nuremberg laws, and then it got much harder. Is there anything you wanted to add about that, Sarah? Okay. Another one of our families, uh, long story short, many members of the Khan family did immigrate following Kristall Lenox. So the, several of them got released from the camps. They ended up immigrating and they eventually made their way to the Dallas area. Um, some of the family members were murdered in concentration camps, however. So if they had immigration paperwork underway and were able to immigrate, then they were, they survived. And, and, and for those of those of those among the family members who were not able to immigrate did not survive. Another family in our, who has a collection that they've donated is the minor family. Um, and here we have letters telling about interestingly enough, talking about the assassination of Ernst von Rath before Kristallnacht has happened, which is just interesting, you know, when you're looking at an archival collection with hindsight and you see something where um, people are talking about a huge historical event and, and they're concerned and they don't know what's hap about to happen and it ends up impacting them hugely. In another letter, the same family, which was corresponding, I mean, what's so fascinating is, of course, people didn't email and text and make phone calls. And so a lot of our families that donated letter collections to us were writing to family members really all over the world. Mm -hmm. And these family members were actively pursuing um, either immigrating or trying to get out of Nazi Germany or following public events and, and current events just out of habit, but they talk about really massive geopolitical movements, but also family movements, and um, all in the course of the, their correspondence, and they're corresponding with people all over the world, um, but in this family, the Minor family, um, John Minor and some family members in, in Czechoslovakia are corresponding, and he writes about escaping right before Kristallnacht happens. And he managed to get to Czechoslovakia, which of course we know is not necessarily a whole solution or a full escape. I wanna take a moment to talk about something really that is, uh poignant and hard to quantify when you talk about how many deaths happened during Kristallnacht, which is that some of the deaths didn't happen immediately. And, and we have proof of that in our archival collection. Um, one of our archival collections is that of the Loeb Katz uh, family. Um, Helen Loeb Katz was a nurse 
in four concentration camps. And her story really is amazing. She ended up surviving and becoming a medical doctor here in Dallas. And she worked on finding a cure for cancer, which is just amazing in and of itself. She's featured in our core exhibit, um, but her father um, paved the way for that. And he was a physician as well. He was arrested during Kristallnacht and was beaten so severely he suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and he never recovered. And so even though he didn't die during Kristallnacht, he died in Vesterbork many years later as a result of the beating he received during Kristallnacht. So did he die because of Kristallnacht? Yes. Was his death counted among those of Kristallnacht? No, but here we have evidence of that. Um, and he was cared for, strangely enough, in the hospital block of Vesterbork, which is strange to consider that you would have a hospital inside a concentration camp, but most of them did. Um, well, I should say, not a hospital in the way we think of hospitals. Um, another, another side of it is, and we've mentioned this kind of already, but there's a lot of evidence of people trying to dissolve all of their financial holdings. Um, so one of our collections is the Cone Collection. And they had to quickly liquidate their store and sell their house and everything in it. And then somehow pay, you had to, we didn't talk about this very much, but you had to, you ended up having to pay um, insurance restitution for the pleasure of having had your property destroyed during Crystal Noct. And then you had to pay a huge fee to immigrate. And so in the course of all of this, you also had to dissolve your property and your neighbors and colleagues might have nefarious designs on it all anyway. So it was very complex and, um, and challenging to say it the least. And meanwhile, you you know you are trying to find a way to immigrate and and be able to start a life somewhere. And there's tons of correspondence in our in our collection and, and other collections all over, where people are desperately trying to find a way to to keep themselves afloat through this horrifying process. Um, just to take a moment, and we're just about to where we need to answer a few questions. Did I miss anything in that, Sarah? Um, I don't think so. Would you like us to, to talk about um, refugees and why people, you know, because Americans have this notion that, well, you know, if I were in this situation, I would have just left. Absolutely. Um, and that yeah, the is complexities the of leaving and why people had left already. Absolutely. Please do. So um, the, the bottom line is that most of the Jews had nowhere to go. Um, those who were lucky got out uh, into the rest of Europe, uh, about anywhere from 90 to 102,000 made it ultimately to the United States, about 6,000 made it to Can Canada, um, a number made it to, to South America, um, uh, Several uh, thousand made it uh, to Spain and through Spain to Portugal. And from Portugal, they either stayed or, or managed to get out. Um, more um, made it across the Soviet Union and uh, into Shanghai, which was uh, Japanese occupied Chinese territory and, and managed there. A million Jews who were not German Jews, they were Soviet Jews, fled from the uh, Western Soviet Union into Asian Soviet Union, where conditions were pretty harsh, but there were no Nazis. Uh, so, so they managed to outrun the Nazis. They were the biggest single unscathed uh, surviving uh, remnant of Jews uh, from Europe uh, 
after the Holocaust. Having said this, um, when Felicia and I were talking about, about putting this presentation together, one of the questions we were asking each other is, you know, what was US policy? Uh, neither one of us is, a, is, a, is an American historian. And um, there was recently a, an exhibit on America and policies and FDR during uh, the lead up to World War II and World War II uh, at the USHMM. And so they had some just wonderful uh, information available. And I wanted to do two things very quickly. I wanted to first give you a sense of how many uh, German Jews and Jewish refugees were able to come to the United States. Uh, and then I wanted to tell you uh, what was required to get into the United States in terms of papers and everything else. So between 1934 and 1937, only 27% of American quotas for Jews from Germany were filled. In 1938, so post Kristallnacht, 71% of the quota was filled. Uh, 1939 to 1940, 100% was filled. 41, 62% was filled. And by 42 to 45, only 8% was filled. So there was a window during which you had a potential chance to get from Germany to the United States as a refugee. Um, you were bumping up against a number of problems. Uh, 1924, we passed wide, a wide ranging um, immigration bill that dramatically lowered the number of people we were willing to take from all kinds of countries in Europe, from countries in Asia. Um, if you were coming from North or South America, you could get into the United States, no problem. So, so, so there's tremendous limitation. In 29, there's even larger limitations because of the economic issues that arise because of the um, uh, Great Depression. So let's let's talk very, very quickly because we're almost out of out of time. And, and I know Felicia has a few more things that she'd like to show you about what was required to obtain a US visa in the 1930s. So the first thing you had to do was you had to register for the waiting list. The next thing you had to do was to gather your documents. To gather your documents, you had to do a visa application, five copies. Um, you had to do two copies of your birth certificate. You had to present a tax document from Germany. You had to present medical clearance from Germany. You had to go to the Nazi now run police department and pre present a police certificate. You had to prove that you had been discharged honorably from the military if you were of, of age uh, to serve. You had to provide an inventory list of all of your property. Each one of these things had to be certified and those certifications all expired at different times. Once you had done that, you first had to find an American financial sponsor and your American financial sponsor had to fill out a recommendation letter, a bank letter, provide his or her tax returns and an affidavit. By 39, it was not enough to have a single American financial sponsor. You had to have two American financial sponsors. You had to buy a ship ticket and you had to show up at the American embassy with proof that you had bought and paid for a ship's ticket, which by the way, was dated as well for passage. And if they turned you down at the embassy because you weren't high enough on the waiting list or your paperwork wasn't in order or something was expired, you now were on the hook for thousands of dollars for a ticket to get out. And mind you, you were not allowed to bring financial um, uh, financial uh, documents or, or money with you because the Germans stripped all of that from you before you got out. Um, you also had to get transit visas uh, because every country that you went through on the way from Germany to the port, particularly if you didn't leave directly from Germany, you needed a transit visa. Then you needed an entrance visa to the United States. You also needed a landing permit to get into the United States. All of this then was accompanied by an interview with the American consulate um, and then you would first go back to where you came from in Germany and wait for a visa to be sent to you if your number in the, in the waiting list came up. The odds were incredibly, incredibly long and it was incredibly difficult. So this, this kind of simplistic answer that people say of, well, we should just, you know, they, were, they should just go. Uh, they couldn't. They, they simply couldn't. And we as Americans, well into the war, 
were deliberately, uh, because there was anti-Semitism in our State Department and our Foreign Service is a sub, a sub uh, agency of our State Department, and they were deliberately not handing out visas. So they were keeping the number of Jews that could get in artificially low. So, so all of this is, is going on. Well, and I'll just say I have seen in our document collections the reams of paper um, and this is 1930s, 1940s. Um, you can't go down to the Xerox. You can't scan it. You can't take a picture of it with your phone. You have to go stand in line at some office, uh, you know, at some precinct and get a stamp and then go down. And also the considerations are severe because maybe you can negotiate and figure out a way to get your wife out or yourself out but not your wife or your wife but not your kids so i mean th what i'm i think it's worthwhile to list out all of those complexities but let's add even more and and then there's heartbreaking stories that are are prevalent of all of these you know, dominoes getting lined up and then something getting removed. We have an amazing document collection, um, which we could do a whole talk about, and we probably should, of, of, a, of a man in North Texas, in Greenville, Texas, who was related to four survivors who ended up surviving and, and making their way here, who wrote hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands of letters trying to support and writing affidavits, sending money, by the thousands of dollars, trying to save anybody he could, um, trying to be that American sponsor, trying to be that domino in the in that big puzzle piece or that puzzle piece, I guess, in that big puzzle to make it all work for whoever he could. And he was trying to stand in the gap for a lot of people his relatives, but also even people that he was very loosely associated with, which to, to us, that's just an amazing example of us, upstander behavior. And, you know, as an archivist, it's really cool because we, all we have is, you know, the letters, the affidavits, the stamps, you know, we even have just an envelope where he's trying to, you know, keep tally of all the checks he sent, which is kind of cool. Um, I think, you know, all the, I have three oral history testimonies I was going to briefly talk about. Well, we've talked about these examples through the document collection. So I think we could just get back to some questions. We've got some good ones here, Sarah, if you want to sure, take a I look. Would, absolutely. Um, so uh, the first question is what happened to the homes and synagogues that were ransacked on Kristallnacht? Were they swept clean for anything valuable or did some people return? Um, Felicia, do you want to answer part of that? Or it's an excellent well, question. Well, I mean, sometimes uh, people moved right in. And I mean, every once in a while, there were, every once in a while, neighbors would look out for the home and, and you know, the, the original owner could come back and move back in. But that was pretty rare. I think the most common um, example would be that the um, homeowner would be forced to sell or just be stolen outright and then never be heard from again. Yeah. Um, there's another question. Referring back to the survivor who attempted restitution for his belongings, was this a common practice, at least in the beginning of Nazi terror? If so, did anyone ever receive payment? So we left something out of our story here, which yeah. is that that uh, the Jewish community of Germany, well, of the Reich, let, let's be honest, of the, of the German empire at this point, was required to pay 1 billion Reichsmarks with a B um, to uh, the German state after Kristallnacht. In other words, Kristallnacht was putting the, Jew the Jews on notice that violence is coming and it's going to be state sponsored you're not safe in your homes you're not safe in your schools you're not safe in your synagogues your dead aren't safe because they knocked over gravestones and desecrated cemeteries i mean across the jewish community but it also put jews on notice that whatever money they had managed to keep or hide or hold uh during the 
the legislative march to kind of cut them out of the, the German um, body politic was over because they were going to get charged a billion uh, uh, Reichsmarks. And that billion was for the murder of, um, of Ernst von Raff, which is fascinating for, for a regime that, that while there were churches and there was even a, you know, a Nazi sponsored church was not Christian. Um, it was a very kind of a throwback to, to, to early notions of Jewish collective guilt. Um, and so all Jews are responsible for von Raff's death. And so they're going to, they're going to have to pay for it. Um, and Felicia, you can speak to some of the financial documents, but to this day, there are people who have gone back to the um, successor uh, organizations of the original insurers who held Jewish insurance notes, uh, and they refuse to pay in today, you know, 2021. So, well, and I think this question is asking about. Jewish families trying to get restitution back from the German government about their property that was stolen by the Nazis. And that is something that's ongoing. And that is something that can be successful, but I would say it is very hard and takes a ton of work. And you have, to, I think, you know, you, it's it's complex to prove what's been stolen from you when your when your when your home and business has been stolen from you, and and it's also only possible if you manage to survive. So and if you manage to survive with and retain your um, documentation, which wasn't always the case. So well, we do even, have. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, even if you maintain your documentation, remember, we, we've talked about this with, with artworks and stuff where people sold under duress. And so you have documentation that it was yours and that you sold it and you sold it for, 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 for Fennigs on the Reichsmark. Right. Um, I was going to say pennies on the dollar. Never mind. Um, but <laughs> um, it's a sale even if it's under duress. And so look around some of these art collections in the United States that um, particularly some of these, um, I should, shouldn't say this, I'm a former academic, but these university-based art collections where they have works that were basically stolen from Jews under the Nazis or, or, they were or these Jews were forced to sell and they know it and they will not turn the stuff back. So it, it's- a, Yeah, there's a some real fishiness, but yeah. at, for families, who, for example, we have document collections where we have helped the family send certified copies to help them pursue restitution claims because they do have a restitution claim, like, for example, the Khan family where the law practice was dissolved and he can prove it and there's documentation, um, you know, I'll, make, I'll get made fun of for this later, but out the wazoo, you know, there's all kinds of documentation starting in 1933, going all the way until 1939 when they're forced to leave the country, just showing the, the sequential, you know, and lengthy ramifications of the law practice being dissolved. And so you can quantify that. Can you quantify that and get back a now, if the person had survived and, and practiced law for 70 years in Germany, can you get back restitution for that full amount? Absolutely not. And no one's playing that game. You know, it's not, it's very, it's extremely minor restitution in comparison to the true loss. Right. And having, having said all of, of this and, and looked at all of this, I would point out, because I, we would be remiss if we didn't point this out, which is that Germany has done everything within its power to pay restitution and to make moral restitution to, to Jews, survivors of Jews, and the state of Israel as the kind of successor state to many of the remaining families of those who were murdered during the Holocaust. Um, Many other European states that were collaborator states have done nothing of the kind. 
Uh, and so at this point, there's well, a real, there's a real difference. Yeah. Well, we're willing to obviously acknowledge the horrors that were Nazi Germany. The Germans, the Germans for generations now have really, really, really tried to, to reclaim um, their place among the nations by, 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 by making something that you can never make right as right as possible. So they really have done well. Um, I, I'm sorry to say that we are out of time. Um, it always flies by. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for joining us for this uh, History Highlights. And we hope you have a good rest of your evening and a good weekend because it's coming up soon, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.